Hello everyone, it's Chaplain April. I am coming to you today with a, I'm trying to make this a short video um, about, um, well, it's based on our notes, my notes from class still. We're still on, I think, day two. <laughs> um, yes, well, we're coming to the end of day two, I guess, but, so last time we did the parable of the sower, this time we are going to look at the healings that Jesus did after, um, what was it after that? Well, it was kind of in between that because we've got a Mark 2, 1 through 12 and Mark 5, 25. So we have Jesus heals the paralytic and a woman with the hemorrhage he heals also. Um, and so we're going to look at how faith um, plays a part in that and look at faith a little bit. I don't want to call this like my faith video because there's, I want to do a video on faith um, and more kind of more in depth than this, but uh, faith play, plays a part really in everything. Um, so we'll just start with Mark 2, 1 through 12. Um, Jesus heals a paralytic. The word in Greek is akuo. Um, and then the word faith. What must faith mean for Jesus to be able to see it? Jesus sees the actions of their faith. So when we look at this passage, Mark 2, 1 through 12. Let me look this up real quick here. Mark. Don't have my glasses. And Jesus having returned to Capernaum after some days, it was rumored about that he was in the house. This is the Amplified. And so many people gathered together there that there was no longer room for them, not even around the door. And he was discussing the word. Then they came bringing a paralytic to him who had been picked up and was being carried by four men. And when they could get him to a place in front of Jesus because of the, the throng, they dug through the roof above him. And when they had scooped out an opening, they let him down the, they let down the paralyzed man. And when Jesus saw their faith, their confidence in God through him, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven and put away. That is the penalty. That is the penalty is remitted, the sense of guilt removed, and you are made upright and in right standing with God. That's in brackets because this is the Amplified. Now some of the scribes were sitting there holding a dialogue with themselves as they questioned in their hearts, why does this man talk like this? So, okay, so now they're going to, you know, question why Jesus believes he's the son of God. Um, but the key there, and now I've already closed this. Hello, two, one through 12. The key is the verse where Jesus saw their faith and he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven and put away. So they knew that if they could get this man in front of Jesus, um, that he would heal him. And so that is why it's talking about the faith that they had. So Jesus recognized their faith and uh, is rewarding it. He, he's recognizing it, saying, "I, you know, I see your faith. And he does that many times. He does it also here with the woman with a hemorrhage. So that's Mark 525. Jesus commends her for her faith. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Jesus says, do not be afraid, only believe. The word is pistue. The word for faith is pistis. Related terms. If you had to match status levels of Jairus and the woman, Jesus inclined toward the woman and not him. I guess we should read this. He's a leader, has a name, has people, all these things in the conventional world. He has a house, he has status, he used to have money, but not now, no name is given. She's a woman, she is not identified with a man. In other words, 
she didn't identify herself as coming with a spouse or something. Um, there's no attachment compared to other women in the text. Contrast the status levels. Jesus seemingly was going to do what Jairus wanted him to do. The woman came along and Jesus engaged her in a conversation. There was an exchange and even the disciples were involved. And Jesus said, who touched me? So if we read Mark 5.25... There was a woman who had had a flow of blood for 12 years and who had endured much suffering under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but instead grew worse. She had heard the reports concerning Jesus and she came up behind him in the throng and touched his garment. For she kept saying, if I only touch his garments, I shall be restored to health. And immediately her flow of blood was dried up at the source and uh, she felt in her body that she was healed. And Jesus, recognizing in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around immediately in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And the disciples kept saying to him, You see the crowd pressing hard around you from all sides, and you ask, Who touched me? Still he kept looking around to see her who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had been done for her, though alarmed and frightened and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has restored you to health. Go in peace and be continually healed and freed from your disease. So the woman came along, Jesus engaged her in a conversation, there was an exchange and even the disciples were involved. Jesus said, who touched me? The disciples talked about the crowd being large. Jesus kept attention on her instead of hurrying along. So it's not your status, it's your faith. Her faith can also be seen by Jairus, he sees everything. The text says she told her whole story. Jairus has all the info when Jesus says, do not doubt, only believe. Jesus asks this man to do what he saw in this woman. Be persistent despite the odds, even the obstacle of death, a call to be persistent. So this is what the professor is telling us, that this is a call to be persistent. Um, this woman provides a roadmap for a man. Also, thank God for interruptions. Um, the number 12, the child is 12, so there's something about the number 12. So Jairus, um, Jairus, um, am I trying to say, uh, had his daughter healed. Okay, the child is 12. The woman has been ill the same amount of time, 12 years. The space around Jesus helps both of them. No one is left out in the space around Jesus. So I don't know why I didn't write down um, the verse where Jairus' daughter is healed. So that's part of this too. I'm not sure where that is found because I don't know why I didn't mark it in here. I mean, I could... I can find it, but so this is saying Mark ten forty six. I really need my glasses. Um, this uh, lettering in this Bible is very very small. Okay. Then they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, a son of Timaeus was sitting by the roadside, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, saying, Jesus, son of David, have pity and mercy on me. And many severely censured and reproved him, telling him to keep still, but he kept on shouting out all the more, You, son of David, have pity and mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, telling him, Take courage, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his outer garment, he leaped up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? 
And the blind man said to him, Master, let me receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has healed you. And at once he received his sight and accompanied Jesus on the road. So, so I'm going to look here at faith because I, I want to do an extensive study on faith because I know that we are told that um, God gives us each a measure of faith. But the Bible also talks about growing our faith. And so um, it's something that, that could use, you know, a study to be studied. Uh, okay. So in Romans ten seventeen it says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So the original Greek, well, it wrote it out in Greek for me here, but faith is pissed again definition faith in the New Testament con context generally means a strong belief or trust in God or in the doctrines of Christianity based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof the term pistis is frequently used in the New Testament to refer to the kind of faith that justifies and sustains believers so it's like okay are there kinds of faith are there levels of faith are there you know and then the theological significance, faith is seen as a gift from God, a fruit of the Spirit, and essential for salvation. So this is why people that have faith and people that are people of science, quote unquote, um, that the science people don't get the faith people. Um, but really you have to have faith in a lot of things. I mean. You know, we, we have faith that, that when we wake up, we're gonna have air to breathe. So what, you know, that's faith. Um, <clears throat> so the word akoi in the Greek means hearing, the act of hearing or what is heard. It can refer both to the physical act of hearing and to the content or message that is heard. So in Romans, he's telling you faith comes by hearing. So it's not that none of us have any faith. God gives us a measure of faith. So I, is that upon salvation? Um, well, we'll look into that. So the word of God is the Bible. So the more that you, you read, study the Bible, study scripture, listen to sermons, those are things that are going to build your faith. Um, a koe can refer to little, literal hearing with ears or metaphorical hearing implying understanding and acceptance. So hearing in this context implies more than just physical listening. It involves receiving and responding to the message of the gospel. That's what hearing is. So when you hear the word, and that's why I talk about studying the Bible, because just reading it, <clears throat> and I was watching, um, what's his name, on Sid Roth the other day, I was watching um, Tony Kemp, and he had a phrase in there that I really wanted to use in this video, but it said, um, it, oh, now my mind just went blank. He said that you, when you read the Bible, you need to read it. He reads it for expectation and he reads it for revelation. So here's the thing about revelation. Everything in the Bible has already been quote unquote revealed, right? So that the revelation is there. It's just not revealed maybe to you. So that what, that's what people are talking about when they talk about revelation because if you talk about new revelation, then you can get into something that is a cult because someone said they had a new revelation from God and maybe write a book about it or something. And, and we can all write books and that's fine, but we can't call it new revelation like as the scripture because that's not possible. It's the word of God that is revealed that is the revelation. It's already there. We don't all have all the revelation or we would be like, you know, some sort of saint, superhero type person. 
but all of that is there. We're just not tapping into it. So, oh, I'm looking at the wrong side of the, am I looking? No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> like I'm looking at the wrong side of the phone again. I'm half asleep. Uh, I just don't know why I'm so tired, but so it's not new revelation, but it may be new revelation to you. So when you read the word, he's on to something there because you, when you read it, first of all, if you're mocking the Bible or if you, you read it and you're, you're like, you're reading it to mock it or to laugh at it, nothing will be revealed. It will not make any sense to you. You read the word with reverence and Tony Kemp is saying expectation and, and your expectation for revelation. So that's why you wanna go deeper into the word, not just read it, but study it. So here, you know, professors are going into the Greek, what the Greek words actually meant, that's studying it to find out exactly what the context is, what the culture was saying, all of the things. That's how we read the word. And so whenever we get those personal revelations and we get that insight from our expectation, then that's what builds our faith. It makes our faith stronger. So we already have a measure of faith. I'm gonna look that up here in a second. Um, so, let's see, Mark 7, 24 through 30, um, the same language he's using with the Syrophoenician woman, Akuo again, she had heard verse 25, we do not see the word faith, but the action is the same, Jesus is trying to hide and she found him. Mark 10, 46 through 52, he heard in verse 47, Jesus commends him for his faith, your faith has made you well. You can see faith as relentlessness. She had done many things previously. She knew that if she touched his garment, the woman with the issue of blood, that she would be made well. She was persistent. In Greek, it's told in participles. And having done this and having done that, having had this happen, then the first finite verb, she came behind him and touched his cloak. In each these of these there are obstacles crowds in every episode the persons are mostly anonymous they all act on what they've heard despite the obstacles they are relentless for the disciples obstacles become difficult they see becomes difficult to cross and Jesus says they don't have faith they come up with the three classic excuses these come up again and again all of them are in chapter 6 one the times not right Two, the place is not right um, this is a desert. How can we feed them? Number three, the resources are not right. If we had more, we would do more. Jesus made them check their inventory. So do what you can with what you have instead of doing nothing. When you take what you have and put it in God's hands, you can watch it be used. The disciples let obstacles get in their way. The persons of faith did not, and we don't even know their names. So we'll leave it there and then I'm going to read some things that I looked up. Okay, so faith comes by hearing. So this is the interpretation, right, of what we're talking about. This part of the verse emphasizes that faith is not self-generated but comes from an external source. It is through hearing the gospel message that faith is birthed in a person's heart. Hearing by the word of God. This indicates that the content that produces faith is specifically the word of God, meaning the gospel message about Christ. The Greek term rematos is used here referring to the spoken word or a specific utterance of God. So how do we apply this? Faith is essential. Explain the importance of faith in the Christian life, emphasizing its foundational role hearing the word, the necessity of hearing the gospel message. This could involve sermons, reading scripture, other forms of engaging with God's word. And then we, what we are wanting is a transformation through the word. So we um, need, to, need to illustrate how hearing God's word transforms lives, drawing from personal testimonies or biblical examples. So these people that have gotten healed, they knew that Jesus could 
heal and would heal. They just needed to get to him. They needed to touch him. They needed him to give them the go ahead, but they had that faith. They had that faith, that knowing, they knew that they would be healed. And so that verse with the woman with the issue of blood is so amazing because as soon as she touched his garment with the faith that she had, he felt power go from him. He felt it go to her. And that's why he asked, who touched me? Because whoever touched him that moment was someone that had a great amount of faith and he felt it and he knew that that person had just received their miracle. That's the kind of faith that we want to have. How do we get that faith? We get it by immersing ourselves in God's word. Okay, so so then I, w I just want to emphasize that faith is a gift. So in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, it says, For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This emphasizes that faith along with grace is a gift from God. And then Romans 12, 3. So you might ask, how much faith do we receive? Uh, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with faith God has distributed to each of you. This verse suggests that God gives a measure of faith to each person. The exact measure can vary, but it is sufficient for God's purposes in each individual's life. So growing in faith. So the good thing is that we can grow. Whatever measure of faith that we've been given, we can grow that faith. 2 Thessalonians 1.3 says, We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. This passage indicates that faith can grow and increase over time. Luke 17.5, the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith exclamation point the disciples request to Jesus shows they believed it was possible for their faith to grow so ways to grow in your faith hearing God's word as we discussed earlier Romans 10 17 highlights that faith comes by hearing the word of God so continual engagement with scripture helps to build and strengthen your faith prayer regular prayer deepens one's relationship with God and can lead to an increase in faith the disciples request in Luke 17 is an example of seeking God's help to grow in faith. It's just like any other relationship. The more that you talk to the person, the more that you know them, the more that you trust them, the more faith you're going to have in them. It's the same type of thing. The more you spend time with them, the more you read God's word, the more you pray, the more faith and trust you're going to have in him because you're going to know that he um, does what he says he's going to do. You have to test it out a little bit, you know, and then you get to a place where you know he's going to do what he says he's going to do, and his promises stand, you know, etc. His character doesn't change. So then your faith grows because you're like, I can trust this. I can trust this. Um, I can trust what he says to me in his word, etc., etc. And so everyone has to get to that point where they you know, realize all of that. So James 2, 17 says, in the same way, faith by itself is not accomplished by action, it is dead. So they're talking about how faith without works is dead. That's probably for another video because you gotta put actions behind your faith. That's what they're saying here. You've got to put some action behind your faith. So faith without works. So the problem is people hear the word works and they think, oh, well, I thought it wasn't about works. It's not about works. We're not talking about that kind of works. We're talking about a different kind of works. So that can be another video, but you do have to put action behind your faith. So if you believe that God is going to do a certain thing, then you stand strong and you keep moving forward and you believe and you just, you put your action behind it, meaning I'm going to keep going forward. I keep, I, I'm going to keep persisting because I know that it's going to happen. I don't know when and I don't know how, but I know it will. 
and that's kind of where I'm at right now with one of my family members that um, I don't really have answers for. And I know God's going to bring me um, the answer. And so I just keep believing. I just keep moving forward. I keep doing the things that I know I need to do and that God will, will bring it to fruition, right? So, um, and then it talks about um, there's trials and testing involved. So James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So trials and challenges can strengthen your faith. So because, you know, the storms are going to come, right? Um, we have storms here all the time. And we can't just like crumble and, and fall because there's a storm coming. We know that we're going to make it through the storm. We know that, you know, um, the shelter is going to be good enough to keep get us through the storm. And that's what you have to do with the trials of life. So it strengthens your faith because it's like, oh, I got through this one. I got through this test. I got through this trial. I know he's going to get me through the next one. And that's how your faith gets strengthened. So faith is a gift from God. Um, God gives each person a measure of faith. And faith can grow through hearing God's word, prayer, obedience, fellowship with other believers and enduring trials. So I pray today that your faith will grow, that you read the word with expectancy and you read the word for revelation. And what you do is before you read the word, you pray those prayers and you say, Lord, I am expecting I'm expecting to understand what I'm reading. I'm expecting you to reveal what I'm reading to me today because the word of God is alive and living. That's another video, but it is alive and living. And so it's a really cool thing. It's going to do what it says it's going to do. So um, just know that God does give us each a measure of faith. So if you think you don't have faith, you do. You need to grow that faith and you need to put actions behind it. So I hope this helped today and um, I'll be doing more videos on faith. So this isn't the only one, but I wanted to talk about this for now. And um, you guys take care and I'll see you in the next video.